morning. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, this is actually um, first keynote talk I'm giving after two years due to COVID. And the good thing is that I don't have to travel. So I'm going to talk about human activity recognition. Uh, this is a conference on ATR, automatic talker recognition. In computer vision, we also solve similar problem. For images, we call this object recognition or classification. And for video, we call it action or activity recognition. So given these kind of videos, uh, we want to uh, classify these into different classes like biking, salsa, spin, tennis, swing, long jump. So this is the first problem. Second problem is that given a video like this, not only we want to say it's a diving, but we want to put a bounding box uh, on the actor. Uh, the third problem is the action segmentation or detection uh, where we want to actually do the pixel bike segmentation and also say this is a golf swing. So um, this is a very complex problem and I have been working on this problem for more than two decades. Uh, the complexity is because of the volume of data, viewpoint changes, tiny action, untrimmed video, and so on. And um, But last few years, um, uh, deep learning has been disruptive and it has changed everything. And we are very happy that uh, lots of problems which we thought are very difficult to solve, uh, now we are able to solve and we have excellent results. Um, we have um, done this work um, a few years ago on action detection. We had a paper in ICCV and we call this a tube CNN. So the idea is that given a video, we divide into small clips and we get the generate the action proposal. We link those two proposals and then we get a max pooling of those and then we can recognize and localize action. And we have excellent results. Um, these are on UCF sports. The red is our detection, green is down to As you see, we can get a very tight bounding boxes here. Uh, these are results on another data set, JHMBB. Again, here we, we do pretty well. We have also worked on the view invariant uh, action recognition. So the idea here is that we get these videos from different viewpoints and we want to synthesize the view from novel viewpoints. And the features we learned, these features actually are robust enough that we can use them for classification uh, from any viewpoint. So here's an example. So this is the render view, this is a synthetic, and this is another render view, uh, hugging other person. And these are the real one. And as you see, we do reasonably well. Uh, and this gives excellent results. You know, we can get about, you know, 20% increase in the performance on this very famous NTU RGB D data set uh, using this uh, representation of the features we learned from cross view synthesis. We have also worked on the tiny actions. Um, and the idea here is that, you know, given this kind of video, it's very difficult even for humans to recognize what's action happening here. Uh, if you zoom in, uh, this is actually persons getting out of the car. So our approach is that we take the video, low resolution video, and we do the super resolution, and we then use those to recognize these actions. And in this one, uh, these are the examples. Here is a ground truth. Now we, we can super resolve uh, by eight, and these are our results. As you see, it's pretty, pretty good here. And it's another example also. Uh, using this, we can get uh, uh, pretty good results, uh, even with the 14 by 14 resolution of the action. <clears throat> so now these, all these methods and many other methods we have proposed, they are all supervised methods. Um, supervised learning uh, is a dominating um, direction, but the problem is that it relies on the large label data. And these um, label data is, are expensive and time consuming. In particular, when you do this labeling for the video, uh, it's very costly because there are many frames. You know, one estimate, you know, it will take um, uh, about 28 years to just watch these um, Connectix 400, you know, which is the famous data set from Oxford uh, to, you know, a 400 class action. So the approach right now is that can we learn these 
uh, features and classification using LACE uh, labels. So these are the approaches, um, semester of learning, few short learning, and self wide learning and zero short learning. So in semester wide learning, the idea is that um, you want to leverage the small label data, which is shown here, and we have large uh, unlabeled data, okay? And uh, these are the two dominating approaches. Um, and now self wide learning that we want to train a model on a set of unlabeled data, and we'll apply some pretest tasks for this. And uh, then once features are learned, then we can fine tune on a downstream supervised task. Um, now, zero shot learning actually is another extreme where we want to be able to recognize actions for which there's no training examples available, which is you know pretty complex. And so what we are gonna do here, we'll train on scene classes and evaluate on unseen classes. So um, the um, other big concern is that now um, these um, methods are being applied in the real world. Uh, for example, video surveillance camera, smart shopping system like Amazon Go, uh, elderly person monitoring system, and so on. So now this data is actually shared on the cloud uh, for computation and which results in the privacy leakage. Uh, those privacy can be the gender, skin color, clothing, background, and objects. And that is um, a problem. So the rest of the, my talk, I'm gonna talk about um, um, and learning method, the paper we had in iClear last year. Uh, we call it uncertain aware pseudo labeling selection or UPS. And second, I'll talk about um, our self-supervised learning method called Tickler, the temporal contrastive learning for video representation. This uh, has been accepted for CVIU journal. And then go talk about uh, the zero shot learning. And this was paper appeared last December in NeurIPS. Um, and in my talk, uh, talking about these um, SPECT, which is the privacy preservation method for recognizing actions. And this will appear in the CVPR uh, later uh, this year in June. So let's get started uh, with a semi-spoil learning. So um, the idea here is that we have uh, some label data. We train the network and train it regularly using the cross entropy loss. And then we take the unlabeled data we run it through this trained uh, network from step one and assign them the labels. And um, since these labels are not real, uh, we call them pseudo label. Now what, what we do, we take the label data and the unlabeled pseudo label data and we train the network again and using these um, loss um, and we then iterate like that. So now, this is a reasonable method. And um, um, these um, unlabeled data for which we are assigning the pseudo labels, um, um, the, the advantage is that we don't require any data augmentation. Uh, however, uh, but it performs poorly compared to other, the consensus regularization method for the semester learning. So, um, now the fundamental issue with pseudo labeling is that because we are training on small label data, uh, it can lead to um, errors in the training. So training become noisy and um, some, some of these labels are actually incorrect because the system train is very small number of these label data. So um, now the, the point is how to fix that. And an important point here is that we want to somehow remove the incorrect pseudo labels, okay? If we can remove those, then we can improve. And simple way will be that, well, let's only keep the pseudo labels which have high confidence. Now, the high confidence um, we found out is insufficient uh, because the, these neural networks are poorly calibrated. Uh, still, we 
we end up with selecting some pseudo labels which are incorrect. So therefore, our approach is that we want to select a subset of generated pseudo labels so that the confidence of prediction is high and also the network is certain about the output prediction. So therefore, we start with the unlabeled set. Uh, we uh, come up with a subset which has confidence um, is high, and then we come up with a subset of that for which uncertainty bed selection gave us a, a better uh, set of um, uh, data. So, um, so therefore, now UPS method is, uh, the first step is same, that we take the uh, label data, we do the training of this, then we take the unlabeled data, we get the pseudo labels, and then apply the threshold or the confidence. Um, maybe we'll get this. Now, for each of these, we'll have uncertainty, and this is shown here, and we will select from this the one for which confidence is high and uncertainty low, and we will have this small subset, and we will then put those in this label data I will train back there. And this method uh, works pretty well. Uh, these are the results on UCF 101. So only 20% label data, we can get about close to 40%. When we increase 50%, we can get you know, actually pretty high. So, and this is a general method. So this works for images also. So these are the results on C410. And here we are showing the error. So the lower the better, as you see, we do pretty well good compared to these other methods. And this is for C400. Another thing is that our method actually works for the multi-label uh, data like Pascal. And um, here it's only 10% we can do, 34% and 20% we can increase to 40%. Okay. So this was about the semi-supervised learning method. Now we can talk about the self-supervised learning. And um, this is, uh, we call this tickler. And so now self-supervised learning for images is working very well. And the dominating approach is called contrast learning, in particular instant contrast. And um, actually what's happening, that gap between supervised and self-supervised learning is completely you know, kind of closed. They are working as well as the supervised learning. And the most famous of, you know, method is called Simclair, uh, instance contrastive. So what we do here, we have an image. We do augmentation one and augmentation two, and we compute these features and we want to make them agree on the, <clears throat> these two representation because it's the same image. Okay, so that's a way we learn and we don't require labels. Now uh, we can apply this to video. And so they have video one, video two, and we can take these small clip here and small clip, you know, another small clip from the video. And we treat this as a anchor and this as a positive. And we take another video, we take two clips from there and these are negative. And then we want to, land the representation, they should be similar or track, and here they should repeal. So this is the uh, formula for that. So essentially we are looking at the cosine distance between these two, which we want to uh, maximize. And then these are the other terms which, are sh which we want to minimize. Now, the problem with this is that, um, that it attracts all the clips from the same video uh, to similar representation. So uh, in a way, it enforces a temporal invariance uh, and which is uh, kind of not good for the action recognition. And therefore, if when you use multiple clips and it's an, this actually doesn't gain much. So therefore to address this problem, uh, we, um, our goal is that we want to encourage the temporal diversity at two temporal aggregation steps. So one is that we want to do temporal pooling of feature map. We want to pool it across features. And then other, we want to do clip level averaging and pull it across clips, okay? So we will have these two new losses. Uh, one we call local, local temporal contrast loss. And this will help us discriminate between non-overlapping clips from the same video and global local temporal contrast loss. This will help us discriminate in between time steps of feature map of an input clip. 
So here is what we have. This is local, local loss. So we have a video, we take these four clips here and we do one set of recommendation here, another set here, and we get these features. And then this is a represent, these are representation. So we want to say that if this is anchor, then we want to make the representation for this similar to that. And then we want to make um, the other clips representation, these and other um, augmentation are dissimilar. So this will enforce diversity at a clip level by contrasting clips from the same video, as you see here. And this is the, uh, the formula for that. Um, so again, is a cosine distance. And we have here those two terms as I showed you earlier, but the way we are looking at these clips is different than instant consortium. Then second loss, we have global local loss. So we take again these four clips and we do the one set of augmentation here. Uh, and, but here we take combine these four clips in one clip A and get the features. Then we slice them into four parts. Okay, so then, then these are the representations we have. Um, so now what we are doing that we want to make uh, this uh, representation close to this. And then we want to make uh, the contrasted with this from this to the rest of these um, clips in the other um, set of these um, clips. And we want to um, be able to do the other way also from here to there. And then also um, of those other terms, which are shown here, these clips. So now what this is doing, it is enforcing temporal diversity at feature level by contrasting global clips, feature map with a pool local feature maps, okay? So that's what we have here. So as you see, so one is we are doing from this to here, and this is the one term, and other we were saying backward from, from GI1 to the LI1. And so we have two terms. Now we did it for one clip here. We'll do the for this one, this one, and so on. And that's why we are going to add these up. So now um, using this, uh, we get pretty good results. So what we are going to do, once we learn the features, we will apply a similar downstream task and we will fine tune on the downstream tracks, like you say 101, HMDB 51 and diving. And then we will apply the nearest neighbor retrieval um, with no fine tuning. And also we can do fine tuning a different percentage of the labels. So here's the first set of results um, we have. Um, and um, these are the different methods and you know, where these published papers uh, as you see, this is a very active area of research and this last couple of years, there are so many papers. Um, so these are the results, self by learning on UCF 101 and fine tuning on UCF 101. As you see, we get pretty good improvement here, you know, about 8% um, or so. Um, then this is UCF 101 to HMD 51, and then this is Connectix and so on. So all these we can, get a good improvement compared to these other competing methods. So now for the nearest neighbor retrieval, so these are the examples. So we have a query action called head massage, and we can get the all our top three using our method correctly. These are the videos which we retrieve. But if you use only instant contrast at last, like a Sinclair or the video, uh, all of them are wrong. Okay, another example action is float gymnastic. We get two correct, one wrong, and here we get three wrong. And this is third example, haircut. We get all correct, and here we get uh, two correct. So, and then quantitative numbers, as you see that in all these top three, five and 10, 30, we can, do pretty, pretty well compared to other methods, significant improvement. Um, now also we can do the limited label classification. And as we increase the percentage of label training and our curve goes like this, and we can get 81% compared to these other methods. 
So um, other good thing about this representation is that it's able to deal with the confusion. So here is the yeah, nine actions, uh, which has confusion. So these two actions, cricket shot and cricket bowling are confused. Another set of front crawl and brace stroke confused. And similarly, playing fluid and playing violin and pull-ups and jumping jack. Now, this is when we train on the scratch. Now, this is when we use the instant contrast or the standard loss. Still, there's a confusion, as you see. But this is what we get when we apply our tickler pre-training. Uh, we can get pretty nice confusion matrix. So this was about the self-wide learning. We, the method, we call it um, uh, tickler, temporal contrast learning for video representation. Uh, now I'm going to talk about zero shot learning. And um, the idea here is that can we um, uh, apply our systems uh, in the real world uh, situation? Because we can train the system on the benchmark data set, but the problem is that in the real world, those actions don't happen. And um, that's the limitation of the training on the you know, benchmark data set. So what we want to do, then we want to recognize actions for which no training examples are available. Uh, and so, as I said earlier, that we will train on scene classes and evaluate on unseen classes, okay? So here's example. So we have the action dodgeball and we have action bouncing ball. And these are scene actions. We have trained a system. Now the question is, can we recognize this action, throw ball, for which we don't, we haven't seen any example. So that's a challenge. So now zero shot action recognition, the way we formalize um, that while we have seen classes, we have unseen classes, and then we have videos, and so they are labels. So now training set is here, uh, the video and labels, and then this is the uh, testing set, which is unseen. This we have trained, but here these classes we have not seen. So it's, which means this, the intersection between these two sets is, is empty. So now the dominating method for uh, zero shot learning is what's called nearest neighbor, okay? So the idea is that we want to um, represent the classes uh, using the textual encoder. Uh, and so we have these classes and we encode them and come up with a semantic space. And, um, but this space is fixed, okay? So then the idea will be that we have the video, we get a video representation and map it in the semantic space. And then we want to find the distance minimized between the uh, video representation and the, cement, the text representation in the semantic space. And whichever give us the uh, best that we say that's action, okay? So um, now during training, that's what's happened. So we take a video, we have semantic space, and then we find our nearest neighbor and the best, then we sort them and say, well, this is the first nearest neighbor, second one and so on. And uh, the, the, you know, and this is essentially the way it works that we go through, whichever give you minimum, it works like that. Now the problem with this is that um, the um, when um, this method is trained, so it uses the pre-trained textual encoding, uh, which means the semantic space is actually static, and um, so this introduces encoding problem. And sometimes what happened that visually dissimilar classes can end up with a similar representation. For example, tennis swing and swing. So also this has problem that the, it's not able to deal with the <clears throat> multi-label um, um, action classification because it, it, you have to pick the nearest neighbor, the, 
the top one. So you cannot pick multiple years never and there's always you have to rank it and it's a problem. So here's example for the first case. So we have table 10 is short and we have 10 is swing and we have third one is swing. Now with this kind of um, static um, semantic space, what happened traditionally that the tennis swing and swing got close together, but table tennis short is further away. And that's kind of incorrect. So to deal with these issues, so we propose this um, uh, reformulation of this zero short learning. Uh, and um, instead of applying nearest neighbor, what we are doing here, that we are learning a scoring function, which give a score for each video and action pair, okay? So this is scoring function we are going to learn, X is the video, and this is um, the text representation of that. And so we can use this for single label and multi-label. For single label, <clears throat> we'll pick the one which give us the best match, and for the multi-level, we can just apply threshold, whichever actions are both threshold, we say those are the labels present here. So, um, so the way it works that given a video, we do the video representation, visual space, we map it here. And then we have semantic space. Um, we also get the representation, then we combine these, put them in joint space, then we learn the scoring function um, for these, which give us how similar the video representation and this text representation are. So this is our network. We have video encoder, uh, we have text encoder, and then we have text refinement module. We combine these modalities here, and then we have a classifier using the standard cross entropy loss. And um, this uh, kind of elevate this problem we were having before that uh, these two, the swing and tennis swing were closer compared to table tennis short, which is should be closer to the tennis swing. And this is what we end up with. As you see, we have correct representation now. Swing is further away from this. And so um, what um, we evaluate this, so we will do the training on scene classes, which is a connectic 700 uh, and learn this pairwise scoring function. And then we will evaluate on five other data set. And, um, and these are, there's no common actions from the connectics to these data set. And we have three data set with a single label. You say 101, HMD 51, rare act. And then we have two other data set which are multi-label the EVA and ACTIVE from the MEVA challenge. So um, for single label, uh, we compare with the competing method and, uh, and you see a 101, we get a 2.5% to 3.8% improvement. Uh, similarly, HMDB 51 and RARE ACT and, and all these three, we, we do pretty good. Um, and this is the multi-label EVA. And here uh, we also do uh, pretty good um, compared to these other competing methods. So now this EVA um, uh, for which we have some quality examples. So here is a video and these are the ground truth actions. And this is what the competing method will give you. And here we get, as you see, we get three correct. Uh, another example, we get two correct, they get one correct, and here we get all three correct, and so on. So we have you know, much better results. Um, now, other data set we use is this um, data set called MEVA from IR Part DIVA program. And uh, this is a very complex problem because of the activities of human and vehicles, indoor, outdoor, and single actor, interaction with actors, and so on. Um, so total, this has 37 activities. And so the for first um, 
um, phases, we were doing this supervised learning on these 37 activities and um, which, which is you know traditionally done. But then towards the end of the program, they gave us this surprise activities, uh, for, like surprise activity for which we, we haven't learned. We don't have labels, uh, the training examples. So what they gave us actually a text, say a person opening a door to a facility, the only track required for this activity is person track and car starts, you know, again, few sentences and person closes trunk. So they also gave us, you know, very few videos, examples. So challenge was that can we recognize these unseen activities using our system. So now this fits in very well to our um, zero shot learning because we already have trained system and um, we uh, apply this and we did pretty well. So this was evaluation done on sequestered data set from my NIST and this performance of PMIS, the probability of misdetection and uh, with some false alarm rate. And we did um, best, we came at the top of leaderboard. So this was about the zero shot learning. So now let me talk about the last piece, which is the privacy preservation. And this is a paper will appear in CVPR uh, in June. Um, and so idea here is that, you know, given this video, we want to recognize these actions, but the problem is if we, if we share this video on the cloud, um, we have these privacy attributes like clothing, gender, hairstyle, physique, and so on. And those are compromised. So now the, there are a few existing methods uh, which deals with that. So one simple is say, well, take the video and downsample it. So it looks like that. Um, and that's a reasonable solution. Uh, in this one, we don't require any privacy annotation. Um, and attributes are weakly removed, uh, but the action recognition performance drops, and that's a problem. Another method is say, well, we can detect the objects, and then we kind of remove those, uh, as is shown here. Uh, but now this requires the labeling. We have to know what are the privacy attributes. And also in this case, action recognition performance is uh, dropped. The third uh, nice approach is that this will do supervised adversarial training. And here they don't, they require the privacy labels and privacy attributes are removed and action recognition performance perform and uh, maintain. So now what we are proposing here that we don't want, don't require the privacy annotation because it's always hard. Uh, and we can remove the privacy attributes and we also maintain the um, action recognition performance. And we do as well as the supervised method, the previous method I talked about. So our self survey method essentially consists of three components. So we learned this, what we call anonymizing function, FA. And then second part is the uh, action recognition branch, which we call task, utility task branch, FT. And then third is self supervised privacy removal branch, which we call budget branch, FP. Mm -hmm. So the main point here is that we want to learn this anonymizing function so that we can remove these privacy attributes at the same time, we want to maintain the action recognition and we want to apply these two other branches. So it looks like that, that we are given a video. We want to learn this uh, anonymizing function, FA and it's an auto encoder. And uh, we have this other branch, action recognition branch and also the privacy branch. So it um, looks like this. And the way we are doing this, we have two step process. So in the first step, what we are gonna do, that we will freeze this FT and FP, and we will learn 
the this one an anonymizing branch and uh, um, we want to change the anonymizing output so that it minimizes the action recognition loss and then it maximizes the contrast loss in the privacy branch okay so that's why we have here inverse gradient the rate and this is a regular back propagation of gradient now once this is done and now the reason we want to do that because we want to destroy all information in video except which is useful in action recognition uh, and, and that's the idea we want to maximize this contrast loss in the second step um, we want to freeze this one and we want to update these two branches and um, here we'll minimize the action recognition to maintain utility performance and also minimize the contrast in the privacy branch. So um, that's basically the method. And we have done lots of experiments. And the typical protocol is that we want to anonymize a model on action and privacy classification. So we want to evaluate both. We want to evaluate the action recognition performance so that it's performance maintained. And also we want to say how well we have actually removed the privacy label. So um, these experiments, um, uh, prior protocol and other papers is that they use the UCI 101 and HMD 51 data set. And then human privacy features are like face, gender, skin, and color. Um, so we are also introducing new protocol um, for evaluation of this anonymous function where we are including non-human privacy features like scene, object, and so on. And then we introduce new data set, which is 25 times bigger than the existing protocol data set. And um, so when we evaluate on the action human privacy level, so these are the results. Uh, on the UCI 101, uh, we, the idea is that we want to have as high as possible action recognition performance. And this is what we are getting. Uh, it's close to the raw data, but our action videos are anonymized and we are also close to supervised loss. And even though our method is in self-supervised. Now, second thing is we want to evaluate how well we are anonymizing or removing the privacy labels. So there are two metrics and they are also, we do reasonably well close to the subways and same here. And this is the other data set. Again, here we do close to the raw data and also we can do pretty well on, on lower the beta uh, in this privacy removal branch. So then uh, we look at this uh, new protocol and new data set we introduced, uh, where we are looking at the objects and scenes, and of course the action. And in the action also, we do close to supervise. Um, and um, in this one, we actually do better um, compared to supervise. Um, and here, that it is 88% lowing down compared to the raw data and same with the scene. So um, now we can also do that. We can evaluate this on novel action privacy, which you know, system hasn't seen. So here we want to do transfer evaluation. So from UCF 101 to train on this one, but we are evaluating 51. And um, the here also we do from 101 to the new data set we are introducing. And um, as you see that we do pretty well uh, in both cases. Uh, and this is evaluation on the privacy. And um, here we actually do better than supervised in both cases. And the same thing for the HVU. Here also is a huge improvement 
uh, compared to the supervised method. So uh, just to put uh, together this thing, so we have two axes. One is a privacy uh, removal, others actions recognition. So we want to make this as low as possible, and we want to make this as high as possible. So our approach is here, which is the best. This is supervised, and these are the methods. And this, of course, is raw. Raw will give you very good results, but it's not private. So here are some qualitative results. So we will anonymize video like this and the cloud will see this, but actual video is like this. This is a frisbee cage. There's another example, the cloud will see this, but this is actually this applying lipstick. And this is another example, and here is the breast stroke. So also here we have video. So this is the bench press action. And these are the different methods. And this is ours, uh, which is the self surprise method. And this is another example playing cello. Uh, again, we do quite good compared to these other methods. So we can also look at the how we are actually removing the privacy label. So this is a real, it's a original video. Here is the supervised method. Here's a self supervised As you see, we remove most of the scene and other things. And here they still have these. In the same case here, like what we are getting. So this was about privacy preservation. So um, let me uh, summarize what I talk about. So I started talking about semi-surveyed learning. Our method is called uncertainty aware pseudo label. It's a very simple and efficient framework um, and gives you the state of art performance. And uh, we uh, are not using any data augmentation and uh, it is versatile because it works for five different, many different data set, the images and video. And uh, it also works for multi-label classification. Then I talk about um, Declared self supervised method for contrast, temporal contrast loss. And here um, we are looking at the temporal diversity on the top of standard instant contrast loss used in images. And we propose these two known losses local, local, temporal contrastive, and global, local, temporal contrastive. And we got state of art results on many video understanding tasks. Then I talk about the zero shot learning, which in which we actually reformulated the problem in terms of learning a pairwise scoring function instead of ne nearest neighbor approach. And uh, we predict the confidence score for each class independently and achieve state of art performance on five benchmarks. And um, the we also got the state of art results on the MEWA data set, the big challenge of surprise activity. And then last thing I talk about the self wide privacy preservation action recognition. Um, and it's get competitive results on the trade off the, of the supervised method. And um, we introduce also a new protocol where we have non-human privacy, like scene objects, and then introduce a new data set, which is 24 time bigger data set than the prior protocol. And um, also we get the novel action privacy attributes uh, and our method generalizes better than supervised method. Thank you.